Um, good afternoon, everyone. So um, thank you uh, for joining us for today's seminar. Uh, my name is Winfred. Um, um, you can see from my PowerPoint slides. So the topic um, for today's like, webinar is writing to evaluate the synthesis of appraisal studies at different level of EAP writing. Okay, so before my presentation, I would like to share with you guys um, something about this background. So these are the other words I published under um, this methodology in the past years. And you can see that uh, it covers different topics under systemic functional linguistics, for example, translation studies, projection studies, uh, grammatical metaphor, and also language description. So um, this is actually a big part of my uh, research interest. So that's why I chose to talk um, um, to talk about here, to share with you guys uh, what I have been doing in this area. All right, so this is the presentation outline. Uh, I'm going to talk about what is research synthesis and why do we need it. And I'm also going to talk about the motivation of the study and the goal of a synthesis, research question and methodology, and also the findings as well. I like this quote. Among all the activities of the academy, what academics mainly do is evaluate. So this is from Ken Highland and uh, Diane from their publication from 2009. So I bet uh, most of the audience are like doing job related to uh, EAP writing. Um, I mean, uh, uh, for uh, in this talk, and you can see that uh, evaluation is very important in EAP uh, ESP teaching. So evaluating resources are crucial in assisting academics to establish their authority, incorporate others' perspectives, and construct their arguments. Over the past decades, and you can see that the use of evaluative resources in EAP writing has garnered significant research attention. And these studies have enriched and also enhanced our understanding of how evaluative resources are utilized in various sections of research articles, such as literature reviews, conclusions, summaries, and arguments. They also shed light on the use in different disciplinary genres, including arguments, summaries, and historical recounts, as well as among writers at different levels, ranging from secondary students to BA, MA, PhD students, and established scholars. So as Ken Highland states in 2005, so he's not a systemic functional linguist, but he gave, he, he made such a comments. The most comprehensive and systematic analytical framework for evaluated resources in language studies is appraisal. In addition, White also adds that appraisal framework has covered all of the linguistic resources in making evaluations. Therefore, this framework is one of the most important one in investigating language for evaluation. So that's why I chose this framework. So now I'm gonna share with you a little bit about this framework. Maybe not everybody like is familiar with the school of linguistics I'm working with. So this is the framework of what we call appraisal. appraisal. So we have three categories like engagement, attitude, graduation. So, and there are some like sub, sub different types are uh, under different like categories. I'm gonna show you briefly in the coming a few minutes. So appraisal is like concerned with the language of evaluation. So it is developed by Professor Jim Martin and his team in Australia under this linguistic theory called SFL. So appraisal consists of three major components, attitude, engagement, and graduation. So attitude is about the range of resources that help realize different kinds of emotions. It consists of three subtypes, which are efforts, judgment, appreciation. Graduation is a subtype of appraisal framework, which is concerned with the grading and intensifying of the attitudinal resources used in text. It consists of two sub subtypes, force and focus. Force deals with the degree of the evaluative resources, such as the degree of strength or weakness of a particular attitudinal resource. Focus deals with the degree of differentiation between different categories, such as the degree of authenticity of a category. So, and then the third one is the system of engagement. So this is concerned with how to voice our one's personal views or response to other people's views or voices in discourse. So um, to, 
to make to make it to paraphrase this one, it's just like it's equivalent to what we call the in-text citation. So in academic writing. So Martin and White adopt Bettine's classification of voices. How do writers into integrate other voices into the text? Okay, so and develop the first delicacy of the engagement system, monoglossia and heteroglossia. So monoglossia refers to a text that contains only a single voice, that of the speaker or the writers. On the other hand, heteroglossia refers to the text that incorporates multiple voices. So that means like academic writing evolve or integrate other people's like ideas or findings or opinions, et cetera, et cetera. Monoglossia doesn't allow any room for negotiation of alternative perspective, but heteroglossia encourages writer or speaker to have more than one perspective in the text. So this is um, a general introduction of the framework that I'm going to use in these studies. All right. So maybe you guys will ask why synthesis, why research synthesis? I have a little bit like anecdote or stories to share with you. So um, in 2012, and when, when I was a PhD student, I did the Hong Kong PhD exchange program at Georgetown University. My supervisor in the US, uh, Professor Heidi Burns, introduced me to uh, Professor John Norris and Nuda Sotiga in the Department of Linguistics. She highly recommended me to take to audit this course called Research Synthesis and Meta-Analysis in Language Studies. So, um, Professor Norris and Ortega, they co-taught this course for like a postgraduate students. From there, I learned this methodology. So, and actually, they are the two pioneer scholars in applied language studies or applied linguistics to uh, introduce this methodology in, in our fields. So their groundbreaking paper published in 2000. So this marks like um, the integration or the introduction of synthesis into uh, applied linguistics this area. So this is a very, like now it becomes a very classical studies. Effectiveness of L2 instructions, a research synthesis and quantitative meta-analysis published in Language Learning, the flagship journal of applied linguistics. So what is research synthesis? So a research synthesis is a type of systematic review that uses repeatable method to find, select, and synthesize all available evidence. It answers a clearly formulated research questions and explicitly states the methods used to arrive at the answer. So um, a little bit different from the primary research, research synthesis treats each primary research like publication in a, an area as a participant, you know? So, um, so that means like we like if you're interested in a topic like second language writing, say for example, and then you just like collect all those studies published under second language writing, each of the study will become your participant of your synthesis. It depends on what kinds of research question you're going to ask. So maybe you ask, so what is the difference? What are the differences between research synthesis and literature review? So research synthesis is just like, um, it's, it's not like, exactly the same as literature review, because these this types of methodologies emphasize the importance of like using empirical data, using evidences to like draw your claim, to answer your research question. While literature review is more kind of like you grab some people's or some scholars like findings or research, um, for example, opinion, and you just like make your conclusion or to support your your claim. So this is the uh, one of the difference. So what is the purpose of such an approach? So to conduct a systematic secondary review of the accumulated primary studies in a certain field. So we, I, I told you guys just now, like for example, when you test one approach, whether it is effective or, or not effective in a certain like area. So we will gather, retrieve all the publications under this approach to compare and to, com to combine findings. Like for example, we would like to see like, for example, a certain pedagogy, whether it is effective in Hong Kong or which, which area is more, which contact is more effective, like Hong Kong or the US. 
So we get all the publication under, under this area using the same approach. And then we synthesize the findings and we compare what are the differences between Hong Kong and the US to answer particular research questions. So we have some research, like we have a lot of community research, for example, like this topic research on appraisal and EAP, EAP writing. So appraisal um, was like put forward in 2000 and more than 20 years. So there were lots of studies published under this like, under this um, um, research area. So we would like to see uh, what are the community findings, say, for example, like, and also to identify knowledge gap. So these are the purposes of conduct a research synthesis. So um, actually this approach has been like used, as I told you guys just now, uh, in applied linguistics more than 20 years. Mountain studies have adopted this methodology, especially in applied linguistics. And you can see that like, uh, except Norris and Ortigas, actually Ponzi and Guess, Susan Guess, okay? Lou Pronsky, and he is the first PhD student whose like um, dissertation is is a synthesis, um, whose dissertation is like has adopted approach of research synthesis. So, um, and he's another key like scholar in the area. So this approach has transformed the field methodologically and standardized its study design. Like by looking at all the reporting practices in applied linguistics in a like, certain area, and we can see how, how do people report their data Say for example, so actually there were lots of publication in this area, but under like Pronsky. So um, this is a very useful methodology to to review findings, to review methodology, to review like context, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay, so an author of a good systematic review should like do the following steps. The first step is formulate a question. So you so just like the primary research, you always need to like develop a research questions. And based on the research question, we conduct a literature research. Just like you go back to the like different uh, databases and then you go to like recheat those publications, just like you gather your participants, you go to just like you. Um, go to school or go to a uh, research site to collect your data in your primary studies. Okay, um, we find the search by applying the predetermined inclusion and exclusion criteria. And of course, not all the all the publication, all the studies will be included into your data pool. So that means not every participant is qualified to be a participant in your data data sets. So we have to set some criteria to include or to exclude like publications, extract appropriate data and assess their quality and validity. So depending on what kinds of research question you have asked, um, and then it's very important for, for you to develop a coding like scheme to call each of your participants. You need to extract the, the every bits of information and you quantify all those information in the end to generate empirical like data, synthesizes, interprets, and reports data. All right. So now um, I'm going to show you how, how appraisal and EAP as an exam can. <clears throat> So the goal of this synthesis is to investigate SFL appraisal and EAP writing since 2000, and to determine the extent to which the study of appraisal in EAP writing has enriched our understanding of language use in EAP writing, to consolidate findings of the field, to establish new direction of future studies. So um, this study is like kind of like comprehensive, like review all synthesis of the whole field. I'm not going to ask a specific research question, but I would like to just give a kind of like taking stock of all the knowledge published in this area to see the patterns and also to see the trends in this area. All right, so because of this, I have developed like the three big research questions for my projects. Number one, what are the prevalence, trends, and preferences exhibited by scholars in the fields of SFL and appraisal uh, and EAP writing studies in terms of the publication and research areas? 
for example, publication features include publication trends over the years, types of publications, prominent researchers in the field. Research fields include areas of study such as disciplines, levels of learner studies such as secondary, tertiary, etc. Question number two, what are the accumulated findings from the application of SFL appraisal to the study of EAP writing by writers of different educational levels? Three, what potential implications could this synthesis hold for the teaching of EAP writing and the development of related materials? Imagine, after 25 years, this subfield of EAP writing must must have generated a lot of findings, right? A lot of publication from different areas of study, from different levels of writers, from different kind of like disciplines, et cetera, et cetera. So, so this study is aimed to take stock of all those publications and accumulative findings for the purpose of like, uh, like, for example, uh, provide some maybe like takeaway for EAP writing teachers and maybe all we can identify some research gaps for those researchers in the area, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so because of this like research question, based on the research question, I I developed like what we call them uh, like search and retrieval keywords. So now, the next step is I'm going to find my participants, right, for my, like, this project to answer my research question. So I did an exhaustive search of key databases of for articles and books published since 2000, like manual search of relevant journals, websites of major authors. So these are the three kind of like major ways of gathering literature in a synthesis. It's important to be familiarized with like all the key databases in your area of studies. And secondly, um, by searching those databases, this is not exhaustive. The, the next one is, and also you need to know that what are the key journals into your areas of study. So you need to do the manual search like each volume, each issue, and then you just search the titles to see uh, if there, there is any publication meets from your like database search. And also the last thing is, the third thing normally we do is to go to those like website of the major authors and you will see that I, for example, Jim Martin, like, he developed this theory, so he must have lots of connection in the area, and also he must have a lot of publications, right? So based on his website and his connection, and you can go to like search and find other, other publications that are hidden or that your university like hasn't bought like those databases. And then the search terms for the database, like for example, you have to think about some like key terms to, to get your like suitable participant for your data analysis. Appraisal, SFL, SFG, attitude, evaluation, engagement, graduation, and academic writing. So these keywords appearing in the title, abstracts, and all types of articles and books. So this is this is a very um important step to to gather your exhaustive like data for your synthesize. For example, the databases I use for this study is Eric Ryan Ovid, Linguistics and Language Behavior Abstract Progress Social Sciences One Search Database at the Hong Kong Polytechnic University Progress Dissertation and Thesis. In relevant journals, like look at these like key journals in area, for example, Journal of EAP, Journal of ESP, Linguistics and Education, Functional Linguistics, Linguistics and Human Sciences, Journal of Second Language Writing, Functions of Language and Writing and Pedagogy. And for example, and the major authors, Jim Martin, Su Hu, Song He Lee, Gordon Maisko, for example. So these are the like, prolific writers published in the area of like appraisal and EAP writing. So, so after that, like you, you apply all those keywords and the search and retrieval methods and you generate a body of literature, right? So then we have to set some like selection, like selecting criteria 
to define, to decide which publication you should include into your synthesis. So then we have the inclusion criteria. Studies are included based on the foreign criteria, study based on the appraisal framework established in March in 2000, studies that focus on academic writing at different levels from primary school writers to expert scholars. Exclusion criteria, studies published in languages other than English because like because we, we don't understand Spanish or German, so we just ex exclude those publications. Studies that focus on textbook or uh, some other texts that are not for research purpose, such as personal letters or extrude studies. Studies whose major purpose is to refine the appraisal framework rather than search research the features of academic writing, we also we exclude this publication. So within the exclusion exclusion criteria, we we take, we got 69 studies like for this synthesis. So this 69 publication are our participants for this research. So we have our participants. So actually, like this is a very laborious process to get all these publications because you need to do a lot of communication. And then after that, now we come to the coding book. Like because we want to answer the research question we set at the beginning, right? So based on the research question, we have we um we develop this coding book to get the, the key information for our research question. For example, look at the out on your on our left hand side, the first column, like the coding categories and subcategories. So then you can see the publication information. We'll code like publication type, author publication year and about the methodology. So we're going to um, code framework. So which part of the framework they use, appraisal, attitude, engagement, or the whole framework, right? And size of the data, we focus on like, have they reported the, the data they use? Have they described the size, the size of the data they use, et cetera. And also like the analytical type, what kind of like, analysis type they use, levels of writing, secondary, BA, MA, PhD, or experts, discipline, like biology, or language training, like IELTS, for example, and domain of interest were extracted from the keywords, title, or abstracts, findings, extracted from the results, discussion, or conclusion, pedagogical implication, extracted from the discussion or conclusion. All right, so we have this coding book, and then we like turn we um input all this code into our coding book. So this is a snapshot of our coding book, and you can see that the name, the year, the title, the source, the framework, the the um size of data, whether this like study uh can be rep replicable. Say for example, so we actually have like this is just a snapshot of the coding book. Okay, so we then spend so much time like code this one. Okay, findings. So the numbers of study over the past two decades. All right. So you can see from the figure, the numbers of study published over the past two decades has surged from 10 in the first five year, like period to 25 in the last five years. This rising trend underscores the significance of the appraisal framework established by Martins and its applic applicability in EAP research. Next, source of the literature. Okay, so, and this figure shows that among all the publications, journal articles takes the majority rares, monograph and are the smallest in number. More specifically, there were 50 papers, nine book chapters, eight doctoral dissertations, and two monograph collected for this synthesis. And levels of EAP writing, and the majority is like bachelor degree students and also the experts, like established scholar. So, and as illustrated in figure four, the appraisal studies here in have covered various levels from secondary education to experts, or among all the levels, writing from the undergraduates, the BA level accounting for 41%. And then, the next one is the expert level occupied 23%. And the other one are like comparison, like, like for example, secondary level, 12%. And 3% of study did not specify the level of the learners. 
and numbers of studies on academic writings from various disciplines. So this is like um, also uh, something I will just show you. So this is so that this shows that appraisal studies have by far covered a wide range of disciplines. The disciplines that have drawn most attention is applied linguistics and generating 11 studies in total. Art and history are the disciplines that generated relatively more studies, seven and four. And we should also like be noted that nine studies marked with term miscellaneous. That means like from a variety of disciplines, they combine different disciplines together when they study the EAP writing. And 25 studies marked with the term NA, that means like, uh, no, no specific disciplines, but for general academic purposes, such as like those EAP courses for undergraduate students, like writing those common genre for university students. All right, so let's focus on research question two. Um, so for the secondary levels, what are the findings there? So I'm going to be selective here. So I just pick up the most, like I would say, the most, I would say interesting. I hope so, <laughs> um, finding to share with you guys. So these studies use appraisal framework to examine interpersonal challenge facing secondary students in response writing. Okay, so let me highlight this one. Okay, the challenges interpersonal. In various subjects, like for example, in L1 context, like such history, literature, as well as argumentative essay, all right, so students at this level begin to face with various school subjects that require them to deploy evaluative resources beyond the personal emotion. They're given opportunity to judge characters in literary words, appreciate values of historical events, as well as argue with different voices. So the findings from this study reveal some prominent features of evaluating meaning in high rated or certificated writing at the stage of secondary education as follows. So here are four points. Number one, essays that are generally regarded as excellence often demonstrates a wide range of appraisal resources. And judgments play a more important role than effort and appreciation. You know, they wrote, they, they study those like history texts. They need to show their opinion about a specific historical events. All right. Evolved or implied construal of attitudinal meanings are more likely to be found in advanced writings, of course, like advanced like levels right as writers will like using those like implicit construal of attitudinal meanings. They, they will not just use a adjective directly, but use maybe a metaphor, maybe use a long like a clause, a noun phrases, etc. Heteroglossy features are more frequent chosen in advanced writing. For secondary students, also heteroglossy, like they will engage different voices into the writing. So that means they call other peoples and to support the arguments. So these are the, um, the key findings at this area and the perspectives, don't forget that. So they, they always focus on the high rated or certificated writing at the secondary level. This is their research paradigm. I mean, the perspective, all right? Comes to the BA level. Um, so, Look at this table, and you can see that on the um, on our left hand side, you can see that like we have different types of like what we call the genre, like summary, argument, biography, explanation, report, uh, geography, essay. Like these are the text types. I mean, all the genre uh, in EAP writing have been studied in within um, like this level of students. And you can see that they use different kind of like perspective to look at the EAP res uh, appraisal resources used in the EAP writing from long comparative analysis to high low versus comparison or from L1, L2 perspective. All right. So you can see that actually the major body of the literature focus on is argumentative essay. I mean, which is quite justified, right? We always teach our students to write arguments. So um, also the research on undergraduate level writing has covered a wide range of text types. 
as I told you just now, and argumentative essay like received the most scholarly attention. And these studies investigate these types of writing mainly from three perspectives, as I told you, non-comparative or between high and low or between native and non-native writers. And it is generally agreed that expression of engagement are vital in argumentative essay, of course. We started to we start to teach undergraduate students to, to use APA in, in their assignments, and so they need to use engagement at this level of writing. So engagement holds a more significant role than attitude in enhancing the persuasive effectiveness of a discussion. Yeah. And there's a balance between dialogically expansive and dialogically constructing strategies in successful writings, like for example, here. Further, furthermore, however, like describes reinforced, say for example, and it's a balance. And the deployment of subjective metaphor, I think, say for example, and contracting metaphor, as we all know, detracts from the general aim of EAP writing. Shouldn't happen, shouldn't use in EAP writing, right? So appraisal resources are used to construe the discourse itself, which means that they're used to follow the convention of argumentative text rather than expressing writer's own voice because they because they I mean the teacher the assignment guideline require them to use like APA and to cite right so you can see that they just follow the convention but they don't really argue they don't really know how to use those engagement resources in their argumentative essay and from the comparative perspective these are the major findings like for example like Lamb and Crosswrites find that L1 English writing show a heavier dependence on engagement resources than L2 writers. It's very interesting, the findings are so, like here at this level, it seems L1, L2 has a kind of like a difference, right? A heavy dependence. In biography essay, Maisko and owners, they found that there's no significant difference between the high grade and low grade essays in terms of preferences for evaluated resources used. And another one in geography essay, who shows that low graded writers tend to make more bare assertions in their academic writing. This sounds also justified, right? Okay, so the MA level, we have identified only four studies in the literature at the MA level. And these three are from, three of them are from applied linguistics. And also, um, and the other one is from a general EAP courses from the North American context. The author finds that explicit attitudinal resources are preferred and appreciation is the most favorite type of effort used. So remember, secondary student they rely on judgments, but then for like, Master, a master student, they rely on appreciation. And then for undergraduate student, the research focus on engagement, EAP, okay? And then like, for example, here at, like for MA level, they focus more on the attitudinal resources, like, like for example, um, in, and also voices, engagement, for example, like the student tend to take a neutral stance in their academic writing because they don't know how to like be, I, they, they, they just report the findings or they just report other people's findings, but they they seldom like try to disagree or try to agree. So they never show, they're not good at showing their appropriate voices or attitudes in their academic writing. Like by Jung studies, finding shows that authorial voice building, it's not only decided by engagement, but also affected by the context, criticality and discipline based knowledge construction. So um, this is one, only one study has the ontogenetic perspective among 69 studies, I think. So by Zhang, so, and this is the, um, the path he has identified in his like MA students writing for an academic year. So there were three stages of the voice development in the participants learning trajectory. First, observer's voice is dominant when students report the objective of the study in the first stage. Just observe what happened in the area of studies. 
Later, the second stage, critique voice is obvious as the students usually review other scholars' work and findings to introduce the rationale of the studies. And the third one, the students deploy an affirmative critique voice when they discuss a finding of their studies. When they finish their writing and when they finish the project, they become so confident and they all in a sudden, they show very affirmative, like critique voice in their academic writing. So these are, these are the three stages of the voice development in a MA students' are, are like dissertation writing process in one year's time. For PhD level, and you can see that it's become more specific because dissertation is really long, and then they focus on like introduction and discussion usually, and usually they focus more on discussion. You can see that, and most of the study falls on like one discipline, but not on the comparative like perspective. So, um, only five studies published under this area. Um, and most of them are introduction, results, discussion, as I told you just now. And based on a successful case in a field of film studies, Coven suggests that a successful writer indicates his or her stance towards the source through various engagement strategies, including a knowledge, distance, endorse, and cont contest. And Gung and Wolfton also find that there were no significant differences in the patterns of engagement choices between Chinese and English writers. So this is quite interesting. Um, in undergraduate level, they're different, but when they come to PhD, so like native speaker and non-native speaker has no differences in, in writing like dissertation when they use engagement choices that like um, citation. And it's also, um, there's a tendency to utilize context resources to directly critique prior research. So PhD student is quite direct. They, they will directly critique other people's work. And according to Chang and Ans first like studies, explicit criticism is not a preferred choice for journal article writers. Therefore, it is possible that PhD candidates are more likely to explicitly take stronger position compared with the expert writers. Yeah, so there's um, so there's a still a gap. Even PhD, I mean, the students, they still don't know how to like um, make their voice and also how to evaluate in the academic writing. Okay, the last one is expert level writing. So the appraisal research on expert level writings focus on published journal articles with uh, field scattered studies, examine other genre within professional academic discourse, such as research proposals, popular science articles, and peer review reports. And investigation into journal article often concentrate on how appraisal resources are utilized in different section or genre move within these articles. However, these studies typically only focus on a specific part of journal article. So look at this one. So it's crucial to consolidate this study to put a comprehensive overview of the features of expert academic writing. So. These are the four sections, those paper focus on the like experts writing, introduction, result, discussion, and conclusion. So then the three pieces of um, finding I would like to share with you. So interdisciplinary research tends to compare the engagement resources. So they, they like to like to look at engagement at this level as well. Like by Suhu. Her study finds that there were a different patterns of engagement resources employed in applied linguistics and cultural studies, even within humanities. Like for example, in terms of attribution, applied linguistics tend to draw upon individual scholars, while cultural studies are more likely to rely on collective voices. All right. And Moyano suggests that microbiology tends to build integration with the knowledge already established in the field, whereas sociology inclines to reject those voices. So these are the discipline differences. And there are also cross-cultural research. I just highlighted two here. 
like she and Nancy, contrast how engagement strategies are used in introduction and conclusion between English and Chinese writer. And Loy examined those between English and Malay writer. The two studies are consistent in the findings that native speakers writers tend to be more heterogeneous than non-native ones. So and interesting again, right? So seems like native speakers use more voices in academic writing, but then you can see look at the level uh, of uh, master, uh, M -A, um, bachelor degree, it seems there's no differences, right? If you look at the bachelor degrees, but when they come to PhD, they show some difference. And the various strategies reveal different academic cultures in terms of how to manage writer-reader relationship rather than language proficiency. This is the explanation by, by them. And they also suggest that the British writers were more likely to assert their critical voice and open up dialogic space, all right? So indicating their politeness, like awareness of the views of others. In contrast, the Chinese writer tend to make, take a unified position and close down debates owing to the influence of Confucius. So this is, this is the, their publication. This is from like from the study, all right? Spanish scholars deploy limited resources of voices in their academic writing compared with Elwin English scholar. All right, so now I will come to the like conclusion or discussion. Apart from the experiential and textual aspects, more emphasis should be put on analyzing how engagement resources could be management success, could be managed successfully in argumentative essays, right? So students should be aware that expression of contrasty interpersonal metaphors such as, as we all know, it is always that are not considered appropriate in academic writing. And studies on PhD and expert level show that PhD writers are more likely to explicitly reject ideas than journal article writers. It's necessary to inform these like PhD or master degree students, this rhetorical preference of the journal articles writers so that they would choose a more appropriate strategies that follows the publication conventions. I bet maybe, I mean, most of the EAP program, I mean, not most, lots uh, do not have this kind of like awareness. Implicit realization of attitude should be taught explicitly to the students, not just use attitude, but maybe use other approach, right? <laughs> And also by Xian, they find that explicit evaluation is preferred in MA thesis literature review section by Chinese writers, explicit, but they don't use implicit. Therefore, this, like the series of study conducted by Li suggests that implicit evaluation that leads to double coding of attitude expression like meet the challenge could be coded as judgment, capacity and appreciation of difficulties seem to be an indicator for successful argumentative writings. And it's recommended to teach explicitly. So it's double coding of attitude. So one, like one unit in compass, like set more than one like um, appraisal item. Okay, for methodology, longitudinal perspective is lacking. We just see only one study adopt longitudinal perspective to see how do like students develop their voices in academic writing, right? As Brian and Ortega suggest that longitudinal study perspective helps scholars to unravel the more insights and findings from learners onto genetic developments. And there's also not enough knowledge on how learners deploy these attitudinal resources across different text types, we don't know. And Matheson argues that learning language means accumulating different register, registerial functions at different contexts. So it's important for us to have a better picture, clear picture of different text types and uh, what kinds of specific attitudinal resources will be used. And regarding the studies on experts like academic writing, most of the studies still adopted a comparative perspective to explore the differences between experts and learners. However, studies that focus on disciplinary differences in using appraisal are also lacking. So it would say compare different disciplines. So various educational level have been explored, but there's an, a noticeable lack of studies on like, for example, associate degree students, because like 
associate degree student, they just start to use EAA or uh, APA in their college learning. But we haven't seen any studies conducted in this area. So that could be another like a gap for future study. All right. So I think that's all for my today's wrapping up presentation. I hope my presentation uh, um, didn't like make you feel disappointed. <laughs> Thank you.